Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is the continuation study of the cup. And we are in the New Testament. Get out your King James Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 14. The previous study was the cup of salvation. This study is going to be the cup of wrath and indignation. Something that uh, the modern church world does not seem to like to preach on. Now I'm going to break this up into a several part study. I'm going to make them shorter because I'm going to make this a commentary on Revelation chapter 14. Very, very little of my opinion. All right, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and, be, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. You know, I'd rather have the Father's name written in my forehead than the mark of the beast. But, hey, that's just my opinion. Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever that he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, comment here. Um, just because you've had a woman doesn't mean you're defiled. I mean, uh, if, you know, God's plan was for a man and a woman, who are both virgins, by the way, to have the woman to be the man's companion, for them to get married, have children. But Paul writes that if you wanted to serve God and not marry, it's not a sin. Of course, the... Vatican has taken that to the extreme and forbidden their priesthood to get married. Although a lot of people don't know it, there are married priests in the Catholic Church. How did that happen? Well, the Episcopalian, uh, that's what they call the Anglican Church in America. The Church of England is the Anglican Church, and in America it's called the Episcopalian Church. The Vatican recognizes the priesthood of the Episcopalian Church and recognizes all their sacraments, so-called. And if you got if you be if you were an Episcopalian priest and you got married and then you decided to join the Catholic Church to be a priest, they would accept you. But and you you know, they're not going to make you divorce your wife and your kids. So there are married priests in the Catholic Church. Not many, but uh, there are a few. And uh, so, you know, I guess, I don't know. You figure it out. But it doesn't say that because they touched women, they were defiled. No. It just that they weren't a whoremonger like I was when I was in my younger days. So... Verse 5, And in their mouths was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Doesn't mean they lived perfect, sinless lives. It just means that they were uh, accepted Christ and his sacrifice for the remission of sins, right? Verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel 
to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. For the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Hmm. Don't worship the beast. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters and the beast. Give glory to him. Verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she had, she made all nations drink of the wine the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, there's the cup of Babylon, and then there's the cup of salvation of the Lord. I mean, how do you drink wine? Do you drink it out of a bottle, or do you drink it out of a cup? So, why does it say Babylon is fallen? Is fallen. Why does it say it twice? Well, my take of it is physical Babylon, the city, fell. But then when the nations, including Judah, left Babylon, they took Babylon with them. So there was a physical Babylon that, fall, that was fallen, and then there's a spiritual Babylon that's going to fall or fall, have fallen. Matter of fact, do you know that the Jews' most holy book this is not the Bible? It's a thing called the Babylonian, B A B Y L O N I A N, Babylonian Talmud, T A L M U D. It is a commentary of the rabbis and their take on the Torah or the Bible and the books of Moses. It's their commentary which they hold over and above the words of God in the Bible. Because after all, the rabbis, they think are, you know, uh, they think they're led by the God, and their interpretations are more inter important than you reading the Bible and figuring out what it means by themselves. Now, if you don't believe me, go to Amazon and type in Babylonian Talmud and see what pops up. It's a multi, multi part volume. Matter of fact, it would cost you around a thousand dollars for a hard copy of these multiple volumes because there's so many of them. I don't know how many there are, but you could read the opinions of the rabbis of what the Word of God means. And you could read one rabbi, he'll say one thing, read another rabbi, and he'll say the exact opposite. But yet they're both inspired of God, they'll tell you. So, and believe it or not, that's what the Pharisees were all about. They were the ones that believed the Babylonian Talmud back in the days of Jesus. So when Jesus condemned the Pharisees for their hypocritical nature, this is what you're talking about. Um, let's say you, when the Bible says, thou shall not steal, uh, you could read five different rabbis' opinions of what that means, and if you liked one, you could follow that and say, hey, I'm following what the, the Talmud says. So, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, if you don't know who Babylon is, I did a study on Mystery Babylon where I used just the Bible to explain what it is. There's also another guy that his name is Chris White, C-H-R-I-S-W-H-I-T-E. He does an in-depth, multi-part study of who Mystery Babylon is. And mine is rather short. His is rather long. I think his is like seven or eight hours. And he only uses the Bible doesn't use anything else 
doesn't, you know. And if you don't know who Babylon is, give you a hint. I gave you a hint. They follow the Babylonian Talmud. So, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup, into the cup of his indignation. What does indignation mean? It means extreme hatred. Not just something you hate, but extreme hatred. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. That means it's undiluted. It's full strength. Which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So if there's holy angels, why would you qualify angels as being holy? Well, that must mean that there are, there are unholy angels, right? Hmm, let's see. Are there unholy angels? Oh, wait a minute. Satan, the devil. Yeah, okay, yeah, there's unholy angels too. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Doesn't sound too good, does it? And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Hmm. Verse 12. Here, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What? We got to, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Huh. That's interesting. I mean, after all, in James chapters 1 and 2, the Bible declares that even the devils believe in God, don't they? They know Jesus. They absolutely know Jesus. Do they have faith in him? Do they keep the commandments of God? No, absolutely not. So, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Blessed. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Huh, and their works do follow them. Now, you're not saved by your works. Absolutely not. But, let's face it. If you're truly saved, the good works will be proof that you are saved. I mean, after all, what good is an apple tree that doesn't produce apples. I mean, it's worthless, right? What good is it? Chop it down and put in a new tree that'll, you know, give you fruit, right? And that's kind of how the Lord looks at things, so. 
Now, when people tell you that Revelation's in chronological order, they're lying. Look at the next verse in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation has 22 chapters. This is only 14. Uh, let's see. Verse four, uh, Revelation 14, 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And I did a study on clouds. Christ is going to be coming in the clouds, a cloud of witnesses. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Whoa. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood, blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. A furlong is just a unit of measurement. I don't know exactly how much it is, but well, let's take a look. All right, I looked it up. Uh, in dictionary.com, a furlong is an eighth of a mile, approximately 220 yards. You figure uh, a little over 200 meters for those of you that are in Europe. So that's a lot of that's a lot of blood, people. That's an awful lot of blood. So if you don't know what city is Mystery Babylon, I strongly strongly suggest you check out Chris White's study on Mystery Babylon. But if you don't want to spend seven or eight or nine hours, you could take a look on my my thing and uh, my channel and take a look. I don't know how long I'm going to be up on YouTube. Um, they've been deleting an awful lot of channels and videos. I just think my time is short. I really do. And I'm going to try to find another site so um and as i mentioned before i was on sermon audio but they uh which is supposed to be a christian website but they booted me off after two or three days so uh when 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 i hear something's christian i cringe because only people can be christians uh you can't have a christian book you can't have a Christian website. You can't have a Christian business. You could have a business owned by Christians. But there's no such thing as a Christian business, period. And if it's a Christian church, I'll guarantee you it's not incorporated as a 501c3 tax-exempt corporation, which is a business incorporated by the state. Because then you got to teach the state's doctrines and not the doctrines of the Bible. So, all right, well, this is Revelation chapter 14. And the cup 
of the wrath of God. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus, who is the Christ. All glory and honor to him in Jesus' name. Amen.